Chaos Proxies. Okay, my name is Mark McBride. Uh, I have worked at various places who've done things at scale, among them uh, Twitter, Nest, and currently Turbine Labs. And today we're going to take a, a bit of a shift from Ronnie's talk, which was great, about sort of the philosophy of chaos and managing the unexpected, and talk about some more concrete things you can do to not just break things, but also fix them. So uh, we'll go through sort of the standard engineering loop. The, the big takeaway here is that chaos is endemic in software engineering. Sadly, nothing's predictable, or I guess pleasantly, depending on how you roll. But the typical loop here is you get a system, it's working fine, some external factor comes in and destabilizes the system. This is typically unexpected, so everybody drops what they're doing, firefights, resolves an incident, and goes back to square one. The only real difference in, I think, the chaos loop is that this is an intentional thing. So instead of being surprised and reacting, uh, you're consciously going to the system and saying, I'm gonna break this under controlled circumstances and see how it behaves and tune the system so it deals better with the unexpected. Uh, hopefully this isn't controversial at this conference. Uh, it's controversial other places for sure. So service meshes are a thing. Uh, how many people know what a service mesh is? Really? Like a crisp definition? My contention is nobody knows. Um, but I think the general, the general notion of a service mesh is that you have sort of a higher order, really fancy layer seven proxy that acts as a more sophisticated network interface. And the reason you want that thing is because the cloud vendors have taken away all the toys people had at layer three and four, and you can't really build a resilient network yourself. You have to trust that Microsoft or Amazon or Google or, or somebody else is gonna do that for you. Mostly they do a real good job and you know, arguably would do this better than you could but when it goes bad, it goes bad in ways that are catastrophic to modern service architectures. And so the thesis is the more service-oriented things get, and they are getting more service-oriented, the more central the network becomes to, or, to your fault model. The good news is injecting a mesh, whatever that may be, uh, some fancy proxy perhaps, gives you a really neat way to manage faults and, and fix them in that world. We're going to talk about Envoy specifically. How many people have heard of Envoy, the proxy, not the thing everybody signs in on? Great. Um, this is a thing that has a network family tree from Twitter. Uh, we built a proxy in Scala. It's a terrible idea, don't do that. Um, but at the time, the, the best alternative for us was Nginx, which was sort of newly documented at the time. And, and there were various good reasons for us to build a network proxy in Scala. Uh, Envoy sort of came out of an effort to port performance-sensitive pieces of that to C++, and when Matt Klein went to Lyft, he wrote a proxy really based on the experiences of building that thing, which was called TSA. The lessons brought over to Envoy are that all these things in a data plane are great. Since this thing's acting as a network interface, sort of, you have a central point to gather data, to look at stuff, to apply policies for resilience, to inject faults if you want to. And one of the really neat things about Envoy is it has a control plane defined natively that is not just SCP and a bunch of files to various boxes. These are capabilities, they're not practices, they're not products. They're great tools, um, but they need a little bit more to be a full solution. So the, the capabilities you have here uh, at a network level, um, there may be more, but I think the four big buckets here, timeouts, retries, circuit breakers, and ejection of unhealthy endpoints at, at some level. We'll go through everything but circuit breakers, uh, just because they tend to be the least commonly deployed and are really, really useful in kind of the entire site is falling apart and let's just stem bleeding. We'll, we'll talk about happier scenarios going through this. So the first thing, dealing with failure. In a distributed system in general, things being hard broken is kind of the easiest possible case you'll run into. And so Envoy proxies in general have three, well, Envoy has three gross levels of, of ways to deal with this. Health checks are the naive one. Um, I don't believe in health checks. Uh, there's various problems with them. Um, they're useful at sort of smaller scale. The challenges they have, are they don't scale well because you have an exponential problem as your clusters get bigger. And we've talked to people who have flooded significant portions of their network with health check traffic trying to keep up with this. And they're very low fidelity. Uh, building a health check that gives you an accurate representation of whether a system is up or down, super hard. 
Outlier detection is a way to just inspect traffic responses and say if this thing's throwing a lot of 5xx responses, maybe it's not good and we should not talk to it for a while. Service discovery, there's a bunch of question marks here, but because Envoy has a dynamic control plane and you hand out endpoints to it as you want, there's a lot of interesting work here to be done about centralizing health checks, putting them into a discovery service, and sort of manually handing out to Envoy the set of healthy hosts. This solves a lot of the scalability problems you had around health checks uh, without decentralizing it all the way at the edge without layer detection. I'm not gonna cover that because there's question marks. Um, but we'll look at, at an example here about doing outlier detection. This is a graph. Observability is good. Uh, we had an Envoy just emit stats to Honeycomb, which is a great tool for doing this. This chart will look at a bunch. Uh, it's a pretty good operational chart, I think, because I made it. Uh, it has response counts at the top. In the middle is P99 response time. Um, if you want to talk about why P50 is uh, sort of silly as a singular metric, you can talk to me after. And in the bottom is this really neat view that's a heat map that really gives you a view of the latency distribution across a time series. So as you can see, uh, on the left, we have a service that's failing a lot. The yellows are 500s. Uh, that's bad. In, at the marker line, we implemented an outlier detection policy that says if you see a certain number of 5xxs, kick out that server. And you can see the system nicely rebalances to have same overall request count, uh, but almost no 5xxs, and P99 response time's the same, and the heat map's the same. So this is all good. Victory. Move on. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is how to do retries, because if you have a service that's only sort of down, things get harder. The nice thing is retries are an exponential benefit. If you have a service with a baseline success rate of 90% and you retry it twice, you now have a service that magically has a success rate of 99%. And you can keep retrying. Um, you're sacrificing time for reliability, which is usually good. Uh, the sort of, you know, sort of CD inverse of this is you also have an exponential chance of hitting failures as systems get more complicated. Service-oriented, great. Uh, Service-oriented plus crappy reliability, not great. So as you add more steps into a process, if they're not 100% reliable and nothing is, the chance of failure goes up. Moving parts, bad. So here's a, a situation where we applied retries to a system. If you see on the left, it's kind of okay. 90% success rate, probably unacceptable in most of the workplaces. Um, but applying a retry policy, this is something like four retries with a timeout gets you almost all your reliability back. You'll see that it does bad things to P99, which is expected, you're retrying, and the heat map gets a little wonky after you apply that. So this is really a trade-off. I'm gonna make things more reliable at the expense of being a little bit slower and latency being a little unpredictable. Um, so now we've gotten to the hardest thing to debug in distributed systems. It's slow. Uh, hard down, easy, just kill a pod, restart it, things will be great. It's slow is super, super hard in most cases. This is a typical latency curve uh, where you have a nice, like, normal distribution on the left, and then you have weird stuff. Um, this is also why you shouldn't write a network proxy in Scala, because most of these things will be garbage collection or some other nonsense, because Scala wants to allocate a ton of memory. So this line here is really just, look, if we've gone beyond the pale and out of the normal range, maybe we should just like kill this and try again. So you don't want to do it too far into that normal curve. Um, you want to do it at a point where like it's guaranteed to be weird if we keep trying this. And so if we do this, add timeouts, add retries, you'll recover some success rate, but this is definitely a sacrifice and your system's not going to be as reliable as it was before. We'll look at our same chart here where we have a P99 thing and like a crazy uh, heat map over on the left. Um, we just made things extra weird for the sample data. And then applying this retry policy, you see we get a nice condensed heat map, P99 is under control, and the request count's about the same. I think we did get some errors. No, I did this too well. This is much better than what it actually looked in practice, but you get the idea. Um, so, this is sort of how we used to, at Twitter and other places, approach resiliency for a system of status quo. And I think the really interesting thing about this conference is steady state doesn't actually exist. 
Um, we went back to the regular engineering loop and described it as like some external force comes in and destabilizes the system, and then everybody firefights and fixes the thing, uh, heroes, pizza, um, and then people go back to work. The challenge here with, uh, with chaos engineering is to come in and intentionally poke at the thing and saying, but what if we lost a node? What if we had a network split? What if um, we end up with a noisy neighbor? And so this is where we can run examples uh, with a service mesh to go through like a complete closed loop thing. There are no new capabilities in this picture. Like you could easily break stuff before, it's like release software typically does it. Um, the difference here is that the ergonomics are better, and this is super important. In the olden days, like even after we had uh, Finagle at Twitter, which gave us a nice consistent set of network policies to apply, the way you tune those was build a new thing, uh, look at it, you know, think about it a lot, do a code review, and then deploy it and see if it worked. And if it didn't, just repeat the whole cycle. The nice thing about the service mesh is you can do this live. Um, I'm going to try to do this live. Um, this is, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I deserve the applause. Um, if it doesn't work out, I have slides, but we'll, we'll try to do this live. So our stack is going to be Gremlin Honeycomb Turbine Labs. I like all these products, they're great. Um, you can do all this without a vendor, but just like you could break your own stuff by just releasing software, uh, I highly recommend um, paying somebody to, to help you out. So uh, I will now go back to browser land. We have this lovely service called Bees, and you'll see they blink because they time out because it's conference Wi-Fi. But these bees aren't just normal bees. These are various service-oriented bees. So instead of just returning an SVG, which would be simple, we've decided to have an eye service and an antenna service and head and leg and wing and thorax <laughs> and abdomen. And so we get bees. And these things all have different latencies and different like pathological weirdnesses. But in the steady state, we get these nice minimalist bees flashing on the screen. If they get slow, they turn red. Um, it's a nice way to visualize the tools and to uh, like see the impact of injecting things. So keep an eye on the bees. Next, we'll go to Gremlin, and we will just rerun, if I can find my cursor. Where'd it go? Well, this is, oh, there we go, chaos. Um, so I'm gonna rerun this attack, and I've chosen to say, like, let's find a wing container. And we'll do a wing, and we will run this, not for 120 seconds, because that's kind of too short. Let's say 480 seconds, and let's let this fly. This takes, what? Active target. Oh, I have to actually click the things. So I'm gonna unleash this gremlin. This takes a while to warm up, so in the meantime, ah. Okay, well, Elmo burns. Okay, that's enough Elmo. Uh, we'll go back and see how our bees are doing. Sometimes it takes Gremlin a little bit to spin up, but we should see, eventually, some of these wings getting all wacky. Um, and they'll turn red because they'll time out. While this is going on, we can go back and look live at our information coming back out of Honeycomb and see if our stuff has gotten weird. Gremlin, have we started? Start this, running. Ooh, things are about to happen. Are they? Oh, did it fail to break it? I apologize for anybody, I may have, uh, it says it's breaking it. Well, let me halt all these attacks. I'll give this one try and then we will just go to slides. And I apologize to the Gremlin people for misusing their tool. We will rerun, choose a target. Sometimes it pulls system containers as well. All right. I can inject other faults as well. So, so now we can see a little bit of red weirdness, but that was just transient. Mm -hmm. Looks like I may have misconfigured this. All right, well, 
Let's uh, step beyond this, and I will return to slides. If I had configured this appropriately, this is what happens when you inject packet loss. And so this was something where I had a system working, I started an attack, um, with 20% packet loss, the request count goes down, P99 skyrockets, bad things happen, you can look at the heat map. Um, the next thing you can do is go to tune this, and so I can go to an app here and say for our wing route group, I'd like to edit this, and this just directly modifies Envoy's control plane and say, why don't we put some retry policies in here for wings? We'll do like 50 millisecond timeouts, and let's give it a total budget of 600 seconds and save these changes, and we can go back, and voila, we can see what happens during an attack. In the first case, where we applied no retry policies, lots of bad stuff happens, the heat map goes, goes crazy. In the second attack, we applied our policy halfway through, so we get that little bit of bad heat map, and then after applying our retry policy, we kind of get out of the weird state for that service, and we get our heat map nicely condensed. It's a little worse, this isn't totally perfect, but this is a very quick feedback loop on try a thing, tune a thing, try a thing, tune a thing. You can see on the first one, I actually didn't know what I was doing. So 20% packet loss, let's see what happens. Um, let's try a couple things and it didn't work out. And the second one, I could get it right. So again, like none of these are brand new capabilities per se. They're really just better ergonomics, faster feedback loops using systems you have at hand to switch things from being like a full build, deploy, release process, and try, which things, those things are typically on the order of hours or days to get a full turn of the crank on, and switch this into something that you can do in a controlled environment in, in minutes or hours instead. And so you get higher fidelity results, you get better results, and you can tune the system while it's under load. All right, that is it for me. Uh, for more on Envoy, which I think is a great enabler of this sort of stuff, you can go look at learnenvoy.io, which is a, a site we have that uh, talks a lot about proxies and how to roll those things out. I'm going to be here the rest of the day, um, probably at the happy hour as well, and happy to talk about these things if people have any questions. Mm -hmm.